Hello, my name is Gang, I'm one of the kidney doctors working at Leicester General Hospital. And in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. You'll find some supplements to this with questions in, on, virtual, on Blackboard, and I'll put, also post some links to the CKD and AKI NICE guidance, which you should read before you attend the renal block or during any time in your general medicine block. The first thing I want to talk about is chronic kidney disease. Now, chronic kidney, kidney disease is incredibly common. Roughly one in 10 adult population will be suffering from some form of chronic kidney disease or CKD. And in people over the age of 65 with comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension, it is far more common than 10%. In fact, I'd be surprised if more, more than 50% of the patients you'll see during this medicine block as a whole will have some degree of abnormal kidney function. Acute kidney injury is something quite different. Acute kidney injury is something quite different. This, disc this condition describes a sudden change in kidney function that usually occurs over a few weeks or, some or certainly uh, sometimes over a few days. And if you look at the number of people with acute kidney injury, this is less than the number of people with chronic kidney disease, but nevertheless, it's still a significant number. This graph here shows you the number of patients who were admitted to, admitted to the Leicester Royal Infirmary from a few years ago in February, March, April, May, June, July with acute kidney injury. And you can see actually the numbers are pretty high, up to about 400 a month. And this isn't just patients on intensive care, this is includes patients admitted to the medical assessment unit, as well as to the general medical wards. And in fact, if you look at where patients are admitted to acute kidney injury, they're admitted to general medicine as a whole. And very few of these patients end up under the care of nephrologists. And the reason for this, we'll go through very shortly. I want you to take a minute to consider, what do you think the risk of someone dying is if they come into a Grenfell hospital with what we define as traditional heart attack or estivation MI. And now have a think, what do you think of the chance of them dying if their kidney function become deranged to the point where they meet the definition for acute kidney injury and they have suffered this as a result of something as simple as dehydration or urine tract infection? You may or may not know the reason why we worry about heart attacks I either estivation MI or non estivation MI is because actually if you have chest pain and develop what we call acute coronary syndrome and you release troponin, your chance of dying is somewhere between two to eightfold higher than someone who has chest pain but do not release troponin. And in fact, if you have a estivation MI and you make it alive to Glenville Hospital, there's a 95 to 98 percent chance that you'll leave hospital alive. Compare this to what to the survival rate or the mortality rate of patients with acute kidney injury. If your serum creatinine goes from 50, 100 to 125, then your chance of dying is somewhere between two to four times higher than someone's creatinine would you have stayed at 100. And if your serum creatinine goes from 100 to 200, so 100% increase, then your chance of dying is somewhere between sixfold to ninefold higher, nearly ninefold higher than someone whose serum creatinine stays normal. In fact, the mortality associated with acute kidney injury is very similar to someone who suffered acute coronary syndrome or indeed haven't had a heart attack. So what do you do with patients with AKI? Well, firstly, how do we diagnose AKI? To consider this, we have to first remember how we measure kidney function. If you remember, unlike the heart or the lungs, which either has a physical function of pumping or a physical a function of expanding and contracting, which we can either see on echo or measure indirectly with things like spirometry, the kidneys sit there and, on, and macroscopically don't appear to be any, doing anything. But on the microscopic level, however, the kidneys are one of the most physiological active organs in your body. In fact, your kidneys use as much energy as your heart, and both of these organs use more energy than your brain. Your kidneys have lots of functions, endocrine functions, fluid balance, excreting of toxins, 
that all these things are very, very difficult to measure directly. So the way we measure kidney function is indirectly by looking at the excretion of something called creatinine. You all heard about this, you read about this in your medical textbooks. Essentially, by measuring creatinine and looking at how this level changes through the body as the kidney function declines, we can get what we call estimated glomerular filtration rate. So kidney function is measured by this number, glomerular filtration rate. It tells us how well, how much blood is being filtered by the kidney per minute for an estimated body surface area. Now we can measure this directly using radioisotope tests, but we're not going to give radiation to patients on a regular basis. And therefore the only way we can get a good measure of kidney of glomerular filtration rate is by estimating it, and we do that through measuring serum creatinine. Because serum creatinine is produced by your bodies as waste product, it's usually excreted at a fixed rate, and therefore if we know how much your body is producing creatinine, and we know how quickly your body excretes creatinine, then any changes in your serum creatinine must relate to either a problem with creatinine excretion, which will suggest there's a problem with the kidneys, or a problem with creatinine production. And that comes to body mass, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So when you look at blood tests for someone with kidney disease, the two results you always, the three results you always see is urea, creatinine, EGFR. Now these are all interlinked. Your EGFR, your estimated glomerular filtration rate, as we already explained, is calculated directly from your serum creatinine. So if your creatinine goes up, your EGFR will go down. And the formula we use have changed over the years. We're currently using a formula called CKD Epi. In some of your textbooks, you will see a formula called MDRD. And the reason we use different formulas is is because as we have understood better the relationship between creatinine and real GFR, we'll modify these formulas to be slightly more accurate. The current formula we use is something called CKD Epi. Your serum urea is another measure of toxin levels that increases as your kidney function declines. Now this level, urea is a very small molecule and it can be also be, is also more affected by dehydration and it's also released when someone suffers from bleeding, in particular GI bleed. So raised serum urea isn't always because a patient has a problem with their kidneys, it may be indication that they are bleeding somewhere. And we measure potassium because potassium is one of the products your kidneys excrete on a regular basis, and anyone with a poor kidney function, their serum creatinine we expect to go up. And sodium gives us a good idea of fluid status within the body. So when you see a result like this, it's actually not very helpful by itself, because this tells you that this patient has abnormal kidney function. But without a baseline result, so without knowing what their results were like six months ago, or even six days ago, you can't tell whether or not they're suffering from acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. And this is what the results of someone with chronic kidney disease may look like. Their serum creatinine will have increased over a long period of time. And as you may remember from coming across other patients for, for suffer from chronic conditions such as hypercapnia or even chronic heart failure, liver disease as well, that anything that happens over a long time, your body will get used to. So someone like this, whose EGFR is very low and we have very abnormal kidney function, they may actually be asymptomatic. In fact, when you look at them, unless they're fluid overloaded, you may not be able to tell they have kidney disease at all. And that's because their body have got used to this rising serum creatinine over a long period of time. And that's very different to a situation like this, where someone's blood test results within a few months has gone from being normal to being very abnormal. And in this setting, when your body is suddenly exposed to high urea, high serum creatinine levels, patients are often much more symptomatic. This slide goes through the definitions of CKD. So remember, when you see someone with abnormal kidney function, the first thing you have to decide in, in your mind is that, is this acute kidney injury or is this chronic kidney disease? And, it, and if this, and the blood test result has to change over a long period, so weeks to years, then it's either like, it's most likely they have chronic kidney disease. 
And when we look at chronic kidney disease, we define patients according to their EGFR, not their serum creatinine, because EGFR is more accurate over a long period of time. And the reason we define patients according to their EGFR is because this helps us decide who needs to be seen by ourselves and nephrologists quickly, and who needs management by the GPs. I'll touch on the causes of CKD later on, but this is, this is very much general medicine rather than specialist nephrology. Most of the patients we see on our wards, and most of the patients you'll see when you come to our wards, have a GFR of less than 15, because that's when patients do become symptomatic of their kidney disease, of uremia, of fluid overload, regardless of how slowly things are developed. Patient, other patients with GFRs of 30 and above are often asymptomatic, but it does not mean they don't have kidney disease. And we have this so that GPs and ourselves can monitor patients over a long period of time and work out whose kidney function is declining, so who needs intervention first, or whose kidney function is actually fairly stable, so who can be left for self-management or can be seen at a later date. So, AKI, in terms of investigations, is, is, very, is de very dependent on your blood test results. And in acute kidney injury, we don't use e EGFR, but we use serum creatinine itself. And the reason why we use changes in serum creatinine to define AKI instead of EGFR is because it's a more sensitive marker of disease. Take a look at the blood test results for this patient. You can see that their serum creatinine has gone from 85 to 108. The EGFR has gone from 63 down to 47. Now those results look like there's something going on. But on the basis of what we've really talked about, that actually often patients are asymptomatic in their EGFR until the EGFR gets to about 15, there's nothing you'd be too alarmed about. Now look at these blood test results on a few days earlier. This patient's serum creatinine a few days earlier was 27. Before that was 22. Before that was 31, and the EGFR was greater than 90. Hopefully, you can see on this slide that actually, by the time this patient's serum creatinine has got to 108, that's nearly four times higher than their baseline serum creatinine, which tells us actually their kidney function has dropped by at least fourfold, much more so than what the EGFR suggests of dropping from 90 down to 47 which was really explained, isn't a massive drop. Certainly, however, you can see from the serum creatinine results that actually this is a significant change in their kidney function. Why is that? Why, why, what, in what context could this develop? Well, it's down to, down to muscle mass. Remember, changes in serum creatinine is either the result of the kidneys not working, therefore your creatinine level goes up, and or, because of your initial serum creatinine production. Creatinine is a byproduct of muscle breakdown. So in someone who's elderly, who doesn't have a lot of muscle mass, the amount of serum creatinine you produce normally is going to be low versus someone who is, a, say, a bodybuilder, who's younger, who's much fitter, who may even be taking creatine supplements. Their serum creatinine will be higher as a natural state. So in this particular example for this particular patient, this was someone who was anorexic, who had very poor nutrition intake. So their baseline serum creatinine was low because they had no muscle bulk at all. And this can be true for other patients. So often we see young, fit, usually men, but sometimes women, with serum creatinines of 150 plus. And that's because they have a lot of muscle bulk and that's their normal creatinine production. So that's why we use serum creatinine as a measure of kidney function in acute kidney injury, because it picks up changes much, much earlier. And there are some definitions of how quickly, how much we rely on these changes. In this particular slide, you can see that actually if someone's serum creatinine goes for 100 to 150, we define them as having acute kidney injury in stage one. If the creatinine goes from 100 to 200, we define it as serum AKR stage two. And if we go from 100 to 300, we define them as AKI stage three. And this is all compared to the baseline serum creatinine result. So it doesn't have to be 100. You can start with a creatinine 50 that goes up to 75, then have AKI stage one. 
And this definition is actually now calculated for you on your iLab results. So when you look at blood test results for patients, you'll often see a sign that now says no AKI. And again, when you're on the wards, you will see this. It's not foolproof. It occasionally still misses patients like this, but it's certainly much better than before at picking up patients with kidney function deteriorated at a much earlier stage. So now we come on to causes of acute kidney injury. This is a schematic showing you what's going on in the glomerulus, not just the glomerulus inside the kidney. And you can see the kidney is incredibly complicated. And unlike some uh, conditions such as acute coronary syndrome, where a single pathology is often responsible for heart attack, so usually a plate, a plug, any condition that affects blood flow to the glomerulus, any condition that affects glomerulus directly, or anything that affects the tubules or the way urine drains out can cause AKI. So the causes of AKI are varied. Hopefully all of you will be familiar with this approach, looking at AKI as pre-renal, renal or post-renal. What do we mean by pre-renal? A problem with blood supply to the kidney. Already mentioned, kidney disease, the kidneys used is a very metabolic, metabolic active organ. And the kidneys, in fact, take up 25% of your cardiac output. So anything that causes your cardiac output to drop will have an impact on kidney function. And this is by far the most common cause of AKI. So we're talking about things such as sepsis. We're talking about conditions such as heart failure. Anything that causes a problem with blood reaching the kidneys. Dehydration. And the second most common cause is probably post-renal. So anything that stops urine from leaving the kidneys properly. It's a bit like your high plumbing system in your house. If something is blocking the drainage system, eventually you're gonna get a flood and things are gonna go wrong. So if you've got renal stones, or renal cancer, uh, extrinsic compression from pelvic malignancy, all of these things can cause urinary obstruction. And then finally, you get things that damage the kidneys themselves. Now, interestingly, there's not many glomerular nephritis, so diseases with glomerulus that causes acute kidney injury. We'll touch on that when you come to the read when you do your renal week. And most of the things that damage the kidneys and causes AKI is actually what we give to patients when they're in hospital. So contrast, for example. Antibiotics like gentivice and vancomycin if we don't monitor their levels. So this is why most people with suffer AKI do not come to renal for specialist care because if their cause is pre-renal, then the treatment is to re restore circulating volume or try to improve their cardiogenic shock or whatever's causing the problem of perfusion. If the problem is, if the problem is renal, and actually most of the time is not due to glomerular nephritis, it's due to something we've given patients. So remove that insult and the kidneys will get better. And clearly, if someone's got post-renal disease, the treatment is to relieve the obstruction. Renal artery stenosis. I mention this because this is in your textbooks as a cause of problems with perfusion to the kidneys. This is actually incredibly rare. It is a cause. This is an x-ray of someone with renal vasculitis. This is actually pulmonary hemorrhage. So what you're seeing here is bleeding into the lung, showing x-ray on CT. And the same thing is happening inside the kidney. Incredibly rare causes of AKI, but it does happen. And this is what it looks like on histology. We'll go through this when you come to the, when you do your renal week. But by far the most common cause of AKI is examples like this. A low, a consistent drop in blood pressure, high temperature, increased tachycardia. This is someone who's got sepsis. The, tr the kidney function will deteriorate as a result, but what you need to do is treat the sepsis. Renal obstruction, again, a fairly common cause of acute kidney injury. In this case, this patient has got a massive bladder stone. His history was actually he was passing lots of stones in his water. So we did extra expecting to see stones up here where his kidneys are. We expect to see kidney stones, but instead we saw with a bladder stone. So the causes of AKI really boil down to pre-renal, post-renal, and then anything else that's done in the kidney. Management. The management of acute kidney injury will tackle later on when you come to the renal block. What I say management, what I talk about is patients have reached renal failure and they need things like dialysis. 
but, off, but prevention is much better than the cure. So if you have sepsis, treat the sepsis. If they're dehydrated, give fluids. If they're obstructive, remove the obstruction. The aim is to, to restore kidney function before they end up with, with kidney failure, because by the time patients end up with kidney failure, they require dialysis. And that's associated with a whole load of complications, which, you, which you'll see when you come out to our wards. And now I want to just talk, spend a few minutes talking about chronic kidney disease. Do you remember earlier I showed you the slides of the CKD staging? One, two, three, four, five. The reason this is important, as I mentioned to you right at the beginning, 10% of the adult population have CKD. That's one in 10 people. The vast majority of these patients will not end up on dialysis, but they are at risk of developing AKI. So if you have CKD and you have sepsis, your chance of developing AKI is much higher. And that's what we've seen is associated with a huge mortality. And the causes of CKD, much like the causes for AKI, are generally general medical problems. These are not splashes renal diseases, diabetes, hypertension, renal vascular disease. So why I talk about that is atherosclerosis in the kidneys in the same way you get atherosclerosis in your peripheral vascular disease system and in your coronary arteries. So if someone's got coronary artery disease, it's very likely they have the same disease process going on in their kidneys and that will impact on their kidney function. Chronic childhood UTIs, renal obstruction. There are other causes of CKD as well, such as glomerulonephritis. That makes about 10% of patients with chronic kidney disease and another condition called adult polycystic kidney disease, which makes up another 10%. And we'll talk about those later on when you come and do your renal block. But the focus of good CKD care is actually good general medical care. Well-controlled diabetes, well-controlled hypertension, reducing risk factors associated with atherosclerosis. Again, these are not renal specific diseases. This is general medicine, which hopefully all of you through the block you realize is easy to say, manage these conditions better, but in reality, it's incredibly difficult to do. So that brings me to the end of the talk. So hopefully you have some better idea of AKI, you have some understanding of CKD. Use the learning materials signposted to in, in, on your blackboard to look at the nice guidance for AKI and CKD. And if you have any questions about AKI or CKD, I'll be more than happy to answer them when you do your renal block. But when you come to do the renal block, my focus will be mainly talking about end-stage renal disease, those patients who have kidneys that fail completely or having to deal with dialysis, and be focusing on the glomerulonephritis, so the much rarer causes of kidney disease. So do make, do make sure you fully understand what we talked about today in terms of AKI and CKD. And do ask me when you, you come to the renal block if there's something you still don't quite understand. <laughs>